Uh, welcome once again, friends, uh, wherever you are tuned in. And um, it's another time that uh, I bring you part two of two on uh, what uh, R.S. Donnell was uh, able to teach in Indiana. But then I'll be going into looking at how uh, or what the Bible tells us and what is the truth of the matter? Because we found out in the first presentation that uh, R.S. Donnell was able to teach that Christ came uh, pre -fall, in the nature of Adam pre-fall. And then he only, his nature was only affected in liability. That is when he came to a point to be tempted. But then when it came to Adam sinning and then possessing the sinful nature, Christ did not fall. And so he did not uh, uh, inherit the, the, the fallen nature and, uh, or the sinful nature. And so that is uh, what was coming out. That is what he taught in Indiana. And uh, in the year uh, 1907, he was able, he was disfellowshipped by the church for such a teachings. But uh, before he was disfellowshipped, there were some questions which he was asked by the church if they were true or if they were not true. And uh, I'd like us to pray then now. We shall look at some of these questions and then uh, look into the real thing about um, the issue of uh, the nature of Christ and so on. And so I'll invite us for a word of prayer before we continue. Our Father and our God, we are destitute if uh, you are not uh, in our presence. But uh, when you are present with us and your spirit is working on our mind, Lord, we can be sure that we shall speak of your word in truth. And so I pray that you may hold my tongue and uh, you may touch with the, me with the call from the altar that I may speak of the heavenly things the way they are and not the way that uh, I like to speak them. And so thank you for your grace and thank you for this Sabbath because you have said you will give us a double mesh of your spirit. And so as uh, Christ changes the bread on the table of shoe bread, so may his word get an entrance into our hearts this day and we may be blessed by it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, before Aris uh, Donnell was uh, disfellowship, there are some questions that um, he was really asked. And um, I, I like us just to hear some of uh, the questions uh, he was asked before he was disfellowshipped. Um, before he was disfellowshipped, one of the question he was asked, do you believe that uh, the testimony given by Sister White to the Indiana Brethren at the General Conference was of God? And uh, he answered, yes. And what was that testimony that uh, was given to the Brethren in Indiana? It, is, it was about um, the belief in the Holy Flesh movement. There was the address in... Um, people passing through the Gethsemane experience. In fact, uh, I'd like to bring this on the screen, this issue of Indiana and some of the doctrines that were getting in ascend ascendancy in that place. And um, there was a testimony that was sent to them. That is, um, uh, first of all, Haskell has gone there, had gone there and seen what was happening. And then um, uh, a report came and then... Uh, uh, Sister White was able to give some information on what was going on there. And so um, the things you have described as happening in Indiana, just looking at um, what uh, was uh, the Holy Flesh movement and uh, how did the prophet respond to them? Mm, this uh, should be in selected messages. That is uh, book two, Selected Messages, book two, the Holy Flesh Doctrine, because R.S. Donnell was accused of preaching the Holy Flesh Doctrine 
but he came to deny about it. But let, let, let us look at uh, the whole issue as uh, it transpired here. And um, I'll, uh, I'll put this on the screen so that uh, we may be able to share together. That is uh, chapter three of Selected Messages, book two. And here is re we read that uh, a fanatical teaching termed the doctrine of holy flesh was started in 1900 in Indiana, leading the conference president and various workers into serious error. This theory alleged that those who will follow the savior must have their fallen natures perfectly perfected by passing through a garden of Gethsemane experience, thus acquiring a state of physical sinlessness as an essential preparation for translation. I witness accounts report that in their services, the fanatics worked up high pitch of excitement by use of musical instruments such as organs, flutes, fiddles, tambourines, horns, and even a big bass drum. They sought a physical demonstration and shouted and prayed and sang until someone in the congregation would fall, prostrate and unconscious from his seat. One or two men walking up and down the aisle for the purpose will drag the fallen person up on the rostrum. Uh, then about a dozen individuals will gather around the prostrate body, some singing, some shouting, and some praying all at the same time. When the subject revived, he was counted among those who had passed through the Gethsemane experience had obtained a holy flesh um, and had translation faith. Thereafter, it was asserted he could not sin and will never die. Elders Essen Heskel and A.J. Breed, two of our leading denominational ministers, were sent to the camp meeting held at Munes, Indiana, from September 13 to 23rd, 1900, to meet this fanatism. Uh, these developments were revealed to Miss White while she was in Australia in January 1900, and she bore testimony of warning and reproof against it, as seen in the following messages. And then uh, I will just uh, we go to some of the things uh, uh, she said. And uh, in one of these paragraphs, uh, she says that uh, Instruction has been given me in regard to the late experience of brethren in Indiana and teaching they have given to the churches. Through this experience and teaching, the enemy has been working to lead souls astray. So whatever thing that was being taught in Indiana and what R.S. Donnell is saying, mixed all these things were errors and uh, these things were to lead souls astray. The teaching given in regard to what is termed holy flesh is an error. All may now obtain holy hearts, but it is not correct to claim in this life to have holy flesh. The apostle Paul declares, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7, 18. To those who have tried so hard to obtain by faith so-called holy flesh, I will say you cannot obtain it. Not a soul of you has holy flesh now. No human being on the earth has holy flesh. It is an impossibility. Now, I like to say that... Uh, there will be no need or requirement for Jesus Christ to come a second time. And as 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that we shall be changed in a moment to change us if we have already the Holy Flesh. What will it profit Christ to change us in a moment to gain, to have uh, immortal bodies when we already have the Holy Flesh? What will he be changing actually? Nothing. And so... Sister White continues to say it is impossible to estimate too largely the work that the Lord will accomplish through his proposed vessels in carrying out his mind and purpose. The things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me, will take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing will be demonstrated. They'll be shouting with drums, music, and dancing, and the senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such a methods, in such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious 
methods for making of non effect the pure or sincere elevating noble and sanctifying truth for this time. And so before he was disfellowshipped, there are some questions that um, R.S. Donnell was asked. And question number one, do you believe that the testimony given by Sister White to the Indiana Brethren at the last general conference was of God? And he said, yes, it was true. The question number two, he was asked, do you believe that this testimony condemns certain things which you and others taught in this state? And he answered for myself, no, I never taught. Uh, uh, and I never speak, uh, I speak not for others. And so on his part, he said, he never taught Holy Flesh movement uh, doctrine, and he cannot speak for others because he stands alone and the judgment shall be upon him. I have taught and do still teach that through the efficacy of the blood of Christ, a holy life can be lived, even such a life as was required of Adam before fall. As to the doctrine of the Holy Flesh, no man has ever heard me preach it. I have maintained and do still maintain that in order to live a holy life, we must eat and assimilate the flesh and the blood of Christ. In other words, we must may be made new creatures in him. In speaking of Christ as being prepared for his early life, the word says, a body has thou prepared me. And in the flesh, the enmity, carnal mind, that is the mind of Satan, has been abolished, meaning that a body has been prepared for Christ and those who are waiting for Jesus Christ, not only their minds are prepared, but also their body is prepared. But then you have to remember that he said that Christ came in a redeemed state. Christ came in a, a state that the saints will be in before they are translated, and uh, or the state that um, Christ will uh, 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 expect them to be in. That is uh, the state of Adam preferred. And so uh, he quoted the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 2 saying that them that are sanctified and he that sanctifies are of one. And he is not ashamed to call them his brethren. That is those who have already been, uh, uh, who have already passed the state where a body has been prepared for them. That is a body like the one of Christ. And what body did Christ have? the body of Adam pre-fall. And that is what he is, is expecting, that by Christ in dwelling, you reach to a place that uh, sin is abolished in the body. Just as sin is abolished in the mind, so sin is also, also abolished in the body. Now, if sin is abolished in the body, then what we have, there can be no temptations from within. And uh, think about that for a moment that uh, man has to reach in a state where there is no temptations from within. That means he have overcome all the weaknesses. And uh, even uh, you will say even the appetite that um, actually man cannot see something and uh, desire to eat something or uh, all that. And so this is some subtle mix up of words and uh, mix up of truth and error which in a, a, a short moment we are going to see that uh, actually what R.S. Donnell was teaching was something so subtle that an average mind and a person who actually doesn't know his Bible well will be swayed into believing the things that R.S. Donnell taught in Indiana, which he is saying even all, although uh, people may say others taught that he, he is not part of those who taught such a things. The question number three that he was asked have you changed your teaching accordingly so that you do not teach the same things that you did on the points referred in the testimony about somebody gaining a holy flesh and being not able to sin? The answer is this question is answered in the answer question number two, and that is where he says, I have never taught the issues to do with holy flesh movement. So they went to question number four and told him, please state in a few words your views on the nature of Christ. The answer he gave is this, Christ was the second Adam. In the first Adam, all was lost, even the seed of righteousness. When Adam sinned, divinity left him, and the flesh of all humanity stood alone. The holy seed was lost, and now that born of Adam, flesh and blood could not inherit the kingdom of God. In order to save humanity, the holy seed, Divinity and humanity must be combined, um, and then man restored in that state. This seed was found in Christ, the second Adam. 
And so you, you can get that uh, the answer that R.S. Donnell is giving is quite a good answer on the surface. But when you remember, he is saying that you must reach the state of Adam pre-fall because those are the ones that Christ calls him this, his brethren, then you, you see that um, uh, the answer is not as conclusive as it should be, but the foundation of giving such an answer hangs on uh, um, a preposition, which is not right that uh, when Christ had wo have worked in us, then we have to stand in a state of Adam pre-fall. That is impossible. It is only during translation that man can go back to the state of Adam pre-fall. Now, they went ahead and asked him question number five. Did Christ's flesh have in it any weakness or natural tendency to sin as a result of the fall of man? The answer he gave is that uh, in my answer to this question, I prefer to give largely Christ's own words as found in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy. On all these points, in fact, we had better sit at the feet of Jesus and learn of him. That is a good one. On question number four, which you remember, he was asked on question number four, please state in a few words your views on the nature of Christ and which he has given. Um, um, uh, he, he says, he goes ahead and says, that uh, on question number four, I have already referred to the birth of Christ showing from the Bible that when he was born, he was called that holy thing. And the same word proves that throughout his life here on earth, he maintained that standard. I have also shown from the spirit of prophecy that uh, the reason he could do this was because he was filled with the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I now uh, 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 read concerning his nature from the signs of time, June 9, 1898, there stood one in the world who was a perfect representative of the Father. And as to how he met the temptation of Satan in the wilderness, it says, but Christ was unmoved. And uh, remember, R.S. Donnell said that uh, Christ came to represent God. And so does God have the nature that man has? And the answer he gave, there is no way God ha can have the nature that man has. So the representative of God could not have the nature that man has. Such a nuances, such a words that actually makes Christ here on earth seem like he is not incarnate. For if you say that does God has the nature of man and so Christ doesn't have the nature of man, that is actually just trying to say that Christ is not incarnated. Sometimes things can be talked on a surface value, but when you look at them, they negate the other point that is being passed along. The question number six, uh, question number six that he was asked, was Mary, the mother of Jesus, like all other women, naturally sinful? Now, you can see the questions that the committee that is interviewing Aris Donnell are trying to link these questions with the issue of immaculate conception. Because if you try, if you, if you are logically following after the question they're asking, they are trying to find if there is a trace of uh, immaculate conception in the holy flesh uh, doctrine or the holy flesh movement doctrine. So he asked, he asked, was Mary the mother of Jesus like all other women, natural, sinful? And this state of Mary is well, uh, it well hangs upon immaculate conception. And so the answer is yes, that is Mary was natural, sinful. That which is born of the flesh, the natural birth is flesh and flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In order to be saved, every individual must be born of the spirit and she among them. But what we are concerned about in this issue is not what Mary was, not what, nor what Mary's mother was, but what Christ born of Mary was. And so you also see the answer of R.S. Donnell. It is, an, it's like the questions in Immaculate Conception that, uh, you know, when we talk about Immaculate uh, uh, Conception, 
we talk about the state of Mary and the mother of Mary, which we are soon coming to in this presentation. What was their state and what does the doctrine of immaculate conception uh, really uh, hang upon? So uh, he says that this is not what we are concerned with, the state of Mary or the mother of Mary, but the, the state of Jesus Christ when he's born. And so he, he, he leaves that question at that point. Number seven, he was asked, is every child born in this world naturally inclined to evil even before it is old enough to discern between good and evil? And he says, yes, a child is naturally inclined to evil even before it is old enough to discern between good and evil. Now, the, the, there is a lot of quotations which speaks about the state of the children when they are born. And... Um, uh, in the book of Romans itself, we are told that the children being born, neither having done good or done bad, they were elected by God himself. And so we are not, uh, the, the issue is that children are not born saints, yet children also are not born sinners. If children are all born saints, then all children are going to heaven. And we are told that issue does not lie with us to start um, raveling about and uh, then uh, why would the children of Amalekites be destroyed? We find that uh, 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 that is something to look into also. And so not all children who are born in this world are going to be saved. Uh, and not all children that are born in this world are going to be lost. So to say that children are born uh, inclined to do evil it is something that we have to qualify what we are saying rather than just saying that, uh, yes, children are inclined uh, 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 when they are born to do evil, even before they, uh, they know anything else. And that means if all children are born inclined to do evil, then Christ is exempted from this birth. Uh, and what reason does he give? Because that which was born is called that holy thing. So number eight, they asked him, do you teach that conversion embraces both the mind and the body so that the body in this life is fully cleansed and is brought back to the condition of man before the fall? Or this is this a work that begins now and is completed at the resurrection of the just? He says, yes, I teach conversion embraces both the mind and the body so that the body in this life is fully cleansed and is brought back to the condition of man before the fall. Now, you can see what kind of thread Donnell is weaving in his doctrine because the issue is Christ came in the nature of Adam preferred. And those who shall be translated have to reach in the same state of the one who is their redeemer. And man must stand in the same nature that Christ stood will be when he is coming back. Now, when you think about that, there, there is no way you can avoid holy flesh movement because if man has to be cleansed body and mind to reach the state of Adam before fall, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, then what will you call that? That is a holy flesh movement, meaning that you have a holy mind and then you have a holy body which cannot be tempted from within. And uh, that is a serious heresy to think about it. And so they go to question number nine. Do you teach that those who fully appropriate the offering of Christ by faith will never pass under the dominion of death? And that the reason men have died and do die is because they have failed to grasp the fullness of the gospel? Answer, upon this question, much might be said. Surely no one will be translated without translation faith. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. But how many among us really even hope to live until the Lord comes? And how many can we expect to have faith in a thing that is seldom, if ever preached? You know that faith comes by hearing, but how can they hear without a preacher? Now, I think R.S. Donnell was so, um, was so tricky in his answers. Because the question is, do you teach that those who fully appropriate the offering of Christ by faith will never pass under the dominion of death? And that the reason men have died and do die is because they have failed to grasp the fullness of the gospel. Simple answer according to what he has answered is yes. Because he says, upon this question, much might be said. Surely no one will be translated without translation faith. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. 
but how many among us really even hope to live until the Lord comes? And so he is throwing back the question. If I told you that if you had a holy mind and a holy flesh, you will live until Jesus Christ comes. That is the, something that he's trying to pose around to the people who are asking him the questions. And how many can we, uh, and how many can we expect to have faith in a thing that is seldom, if ever preached? And so he's asking, even if I taught you today that your mind will be purified and your flesh will be purified, in that you can wait until the, the, the second coming of Jesus Christ, who will believe such a thing, even if it ever was preached? And so he is doing a throwback to them that really they will not even believe if he, teach, he taught them about that. And now uh, I'll try to go to the uh, uh, to what he says at last, uh, that um, he says, we are told that Enoch is a type of translated ones. Now, if it took faith to translate Enoch, we need not to be very uneasy that anyone will be translated who does not have the faith. I teach that those who fully appropriate the power of the gospel of Christ need not to die. Now he comes to admit it. Because if this flesh in this current world can reach a place that no corruption exists in it, then there cannot be death. Because this flesh, in some way or another, dies because of the corruption. It reaches a place that we age and die. Even if we have not seen, if even we have conquered sin, our flesh gives us away because we have been brought in this world and our flesh have suffered the fallen nature. It degenerates as time goes by, but we know that um, the saints who will be translated, their flesh will never degenerate because they will have a body that does not degenerate. It will be a restored body. And so for Donald Jones uh, to say, uh, for uh, Donald, R.S. Donald to say, I teach that those who fully appropriate the power of the gospel of Christ need not to die. He is admitting that really he taught the holy flesh doctrine. Because we found in Selected Messages Book 2 that they taught that um, those who come to this Gethsemane experience will not see death. And I, I don't want to use my own words. Let us just go back to this, uh, 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 to Selected Messages Book 2 and be able to see what um, uh, this uh, Holy Flesh doctrine was about. Uh, I go back again to the Holy Flesh doctrine. A fanatical teaching term, the doctrine of the Holy Flesh was started in 1900 in Indiana, leading the conference president and various workers into serious error. This theory alleged that those who follow the savior must have their fallen natures perfected by passing through a, ga a garden of Gethsemane experience, thus acquiring a state of physical sinlessness as an essential preparation for translation. And then uh, it went on to say that um, when the subject revived, uh, he was, after passing through the Gethsemane experience, when the subject revived, he was counted among those who had passed through the Gethsemane experience had obtained holy flesh and had translation faith. Now, these are the very same words that R.S. Donnell uses in his article that we must have translation faith. And what is this translation faith? Thereafter, it was asserted he could not sin and will never die. I want you to see the words of uh, R.S. Donnell. I, I'm repeating these things so that um, we may understand how subtle the things were. He says, uh, upon this question much must be said, surely no one will be translated without translation faith. Do you see that? In the holy flesh fanatical doctrine, you must have translation faith. And what is this translation faith that you might reach a state where you are sinless, that your body cannot sin, 
And that is what he says, I teach that those who fully appropriate the power of the gospel of Christ need not to die. Very serious. Now let us enter into the second section of this presentation. How does this really incorporate the immaculate conception doctrine? And what does the Bible and the spirit of prophecy talk about the nature of Christ and our nature? Before uh, I go into details on this, and uh, I, I, I plan to go through subsequent presentations on the nature of Christ and the nature of man uh, as we continue in this issue uh, under the presentation of spiritualism and what is really gaining ascendant in the church and what people are speaking about. I'd like to take you to the book of Leviticus. I'd like to take you to the book of uh, Leviticus and just try to have a glimpse of what the Bible talks about uh, these issues. And uh, Leviticus, Leviticus, um, what is that? Is it uh, chapter 25? Uh, Leviticus chapter 25, um, verses, um, let me see the verse. Chapter 25 from verses 47. I'll try to put it on the screen that we may read together. Now, talking about uh, the kinsman redeemer, I want us to be careful in what we are reading and try to think about what R.S. Donnell was teaching. In Leviticus 25, verse 47, uh, we are told, and if a sojourner or a stranger works rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him works poor and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee or to the stock of the stranger's family, and after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. So he will not be re redeemed by a strange person. And when we talk about being a brethren, then it means being of that family. So Christ had to be made of our family so as to redeem us. He could not come in a strange uh state and be able to redeem people, but he came as our brethren. Verse 49 says, either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. Now, we cannot redeem ourselves, and that is why Christ took the initiative to be able to redeem us. And uh, there is uh, something that E.G. talks about uh, Christ partaking of uh, the divinity. Uh, and uh, uh, I wish uh, that uh, I could get this quickly. That uh, the time that the divinity combined with uh, uh, humanity, we are not told and we should not speculate about that. Uh, and so uh, bottom line, we are told that um, really uh, a kinsman redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, should be able to redeem the, the person that uh, has been uh, uh, bought, has been bought by the, the stranger. And so we find that uh, Christ was able to come in, uh, in the nature of man or in the nature of Adam, not before, but after the fall. But then there are underlying issues in this because one of uh, the 1888 messages also 
had to do with the nature of Christ. One of um, the 1888 messages was about the two Adams in Minneapolis, 1888. And so I just want to lay a groundwork and then I see where God can reach us and then we shall pray. Basis for existence of Seventh-day Adventism. Several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. That is in Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. The above showed that the 1888 message is not or cannot be re-emphasis of the 16th century doctrines as important as they are. The uniqueness of Adventism. Uh, justification by faith was the heart of the 1888 message. If the message as proclaimed by theologians and evangelists of Sunday keeping churches is the same as preached by us, then the question is begging, what reason do Seventh-day Adventists have for existing? And you find that this weaving in of uh, the Holy Flesh movement and pantheism, spiritualism, this Indian mysticism that we try to tend to mix up with the gospel is nothing but falsehood. And Seventh-day Adventists have... Uh, a message which is unique in its nature. And as we build up this and tackle the Indiana message, we are told John Calvin, a thought leader of the 16th century reformation said, so long as we are without Christ and separated from him, nothing which he suffered and did for the salvation of human race is of the last least benefit to us. The Institutes of the Christian Religion, book three, chapter one, paragraph one. Then the pretext striking Congress Romans 5, 18, therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So who are these ones? First Corinthians 15, 45, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual and um, the first man is of the earth earthly the second man is the lord of heaven as is the earthy such are they also that are earthy and as is the heavenly such are they also that are heavenly and as we have borne the image of the earthy we shall also bear the image of heavenly but do these scriptures mean that christ came in the state of adam preferred for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And so this is the contrast between the two Adam. For us in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And this simply what we are reading through is that um, if we believe in Christ, we shall be able to overcome sin. And in the end, we shall be given bodies that actually do not decay if we believe in Christ. Note that while we are still here on earth, we can get the bodies that do not decay. No, when we believe in Christ, we shall reach uh, a time when Christ comes to translate us, he shall give us that which is the spiritual bodies. In that, first of all, we are born of earthly bodies, and then we shall be born of spiritual bodies. Now, that body, that body in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 15, verse um, 45 onwards, we are told that uh, those bodies will be changed in a moment when Christ comes. And so the holy flesh doctrine that man reaches a place that he has translation faith. And this translation faith is that his body has come to a state of Adam preferred. How is it connected to original sin concept and immaculate conception? This is what I wanted to show us and the exemption of Mary and all that stuff because you find that um, the committee was asking him questions that tends to be asked on the issue of original sin concept and immaculate conception. This is coming from, from uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones in General Conference Bulletin. Um, that is uh, page 404, paragraph 5. It is April 22, 1901. Was Christ that holy thing which was born of the Virgin Mary born in a sinful flesh? 
Did you ever hear of the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception? So Alonzo Trevor Jones is asking some question that uh, the committee was able to ask R.S. Donnell. And R.S. Donnell was able to assert that um, we must have a holy flesh or we must have what he terms as a translation faith, man to reach a point that he cannot die. But what is all this about holy flesh movement? Where did they get their doctrines or their ideas? And do you know what it is? That is the immaculate conception. Some of you possibly have supposed in hearing of it that it meant that Jesus Christ was born sinless. That is not the Catholic dogma at all. The doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was born sinless. Why? Ostensibly, to magnify Jesus, really the work of the devil to put a wide gulf between Jesus, the Savior of men, and the men whom he came to save, so that one could pass over to the other, could not pass over to the other. That is all. And so the doctrine of Immaculate Conception is that Christ is differentiated so much from those who came to sin. And there's a gulf so fixed in that you cannot identify with Christ. And if you cannot identify with Christ, then there is just a danger of giving up and saying, I'm not at the end of the day, Christ. And so don't expect me to live the life that Christ lived because I'm not Christ. He had that advantage. We tend to get into this era that he had an advantage and we, we can speak about these things in broad. He continues, we need to settle everyone of us whether we are out of the Church of Rome or not. There are a great many that have got the marks yet, but I'm persuaded of this, that every soul who is here tonight desires to know the way of truth and righteousness. Congregation, amen. And that there is no one here who is unconsciously clinging to the dogmas of the papacy who does not desire to be freed from them. And so it might be that in our thinking and uh, expressing ourselves, we are unconsciously espousing the dogmas of Rome. And along the Trevor Jones is saying, all of us may come to a position to really design or be able to tell of the truth that we have come out of Rome. And so if we examine the things we believe on the nature of Christ and the nature of man, have we come to that position that we have really come out of the church of Rome or there are things we are holding on to unconsciously like the things of the Holy Flesh movement and Christ pre-fall, coming pre-fall of Adam and gaining a Holy Flesh before the translation, having this translation faith. Continued on, we are told, he says, do you not see that the idea that the flesh of Jesus was not like ours because we know ours is sinful necessarily involves the idea of the immaculate conception of the Virgin Mary. Mind you, in him was no sin, but the mystery of God manifest in the flesh, the marvel of the ages, the wonder of the angels, that thing which even now they desire to understand and which they can form no just idea of only as they are taught it by the church is the perfect manifestation of the life of God in it is spotless purity in the midst of sinful flesh. And then the congregation was amen. All that is a marvel is it known. And so along the Trevor Jones is trying to bring out this idea that uh, the idea that uh, Maybe R.S. Donnell and the people of Immaculate Conception are teaching are the same and the same thing, that Christ was unto, unlike his brethren. Jesus was not like, uh, uh, the flesh of Jesus Christ was not like ours. Suppose we start with the idea for a moment that Jesus was so separate from us, that is so different from us that he did not have in his flesh anything to contend with. Remember, Donnell has told us that if we have the translation faith, we reach at a point we cannot die and we reach at a point that we cannot sin. Which is so, uh, if taken to a casual point that uh, we have to reach at a point that we do not sin either by thought or by word, it seems 
that he is bringing out that idea, but he is not bringing that out idea. He is mixing up with his own things. Suppose we start with the idea for a moment that Jesus was so separate from us, that is so different from us that he did not have in his flesh anything to contend with. As we will reach a point that we don't contend with according to the Holy Flesh doctrine. It was sinless flesh. Then, of course, you see how the Roman Catholic dogma of the Immaculate Conception necessarily follows. By why, but why stop there? Mary being born sinless, then of course her mother also had sinless flesh. But you cannot stop there. You must go back to her mother and in turn her mother and her mother and her parents and so back until you come to Adam. And the result, there never was a fall. Adam never sinned. And thus you see, by that tracing of it, we find the essential identity of Roman Catholicism and what? Spiritualism and all other false doctrines. So you will not just stop at Christ having a sinless state, but you will go until you come to Adam pre-fall, which means that Adam never fell. You now start getting that um, these ideas are nothing but the doctrines of devils. And uh, we are told that there are spiritualism. And what is spiritualism? At a basic level, spiritualism is a concept that uh, we have immortal souls, that man will not die. Thou shall not die. And so if this holy flesh have reached a place before translation that it cannot be tempted within and it cannot be corrupted, then surely it will not die. That is spiritualism. That is the same doctrine that the devil preached in Genesis chapter 3 to human beings, thou shall not surely die. Now, Alonso Trevor Jones continues that um, uh, evolutions also which claim that there never has been a fall, but only an ascent, the spiritualistic idea that everything in man is right and man is God himself. You see it comes to that when you trace it back. Again, he says, the words of the Bible concerning Christ we have read, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now, I'll go straight away to the Bible in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. I, want, I don't want us to lose this thought. Hebrews chapter 5. And uh, I'm looking at uh, verse uh, 5. Hebrews chapter 5. And uh, I'm looking at uh, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Why could Jesus Christ pray to be saved from death when he had a flesh that could not die? Because Adam in his pre-fall, he had a flesh that could not die. I mean, although we cannot say that Adam was born uh, uh, immortal, but he had this flesh that um, uh, had not seen corruption and had that vital power and could not see corruption. I mean that uh, if Adam had not sinned, surely he could have not died. He could have, we are told, been um, brought to the state of the angels. And so if Christ had the flesh of those already redeemed and the flesh of Adam pre-fall, then how could he pray to be saved from death? How can you pray for something that cannot happen to you? It makes a mockery of the Bible. But he prayed that he could be saved from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedient by the things which he suffered. So Christ in the flesh that he had was able to endure the contradiction of the temptations. 
by surrendering his will to his father. Now, what will be the meaning of saying that he endured this if he could not even be tempted because he, had, he was born in a redeemed state? Because to be born in a redeemed state is to be born in a state which actually sin, uh, you have conquered sin. And how could he conquer sin if he had not been tried with sin? These are the contradictions that comes from the holy flesh doctrine. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. And when was Christ made an author of eternal salvation? It's only after triumphing over death that he was made perfect. He assured everyone of resurrection. He was not made perfect. He was not made the author of eternal salvation before he even uh, was tempted. It is after conquering that he could give his conquering power to the saints. So uh, if you do not read the things that Donnell was able to teach, there are things which are coming into the church subtly. And uh, how are they coming into the church subtly? People say that uh, Christ has redeemed me. I have the indwelling power of Christ. Some go to the literal point and say that um, we should not be even careful with what we speak because Christ lives in us and he is the one that speaks. And so you, you try to wonder at such a statements that uh, people have reached at a point that they are not even careful to what they are speaking because Christ in them is the one doing the speaking and they can never be wrong. And uh, just uh, the, the, this week that is ending, we have uh, been able to see some filthy language and people say that uh, uh, they are experiencing the power of Christ in themselves. And if you are reading their words, actually they are very filthy words. Even the little children will be able to close their eyes at such a words. But then the people are, this, the same people are claiming that they are, are experiencing a closer relationship with Christ than they ever did ever before. But when you look at their words, they are very filthy words. They are words that which you cannot even fathom. And to what thing is this? It is the doctrine of the holy flesh. It is spiritualism. It is the immaculate conception. Christ in you, speaking in you, you cannot sin. And so you, you, da, you don't have to be careful uh, of anything because you cannot be tempted with it. Actually, your flesh has reached at a place it cannot sin. So, but the Bible speaks contrary to such a doctrines. And so Christ himself suffered. How many of you are there who think that the suffering of Christ was only the few moments that he hung upon the cross when his hands and feet was pierced or while being mocked by the Roman soldiers? No, not then alone. He suffered being tempted. Jesus Christ suffered no less than, no less when after his baptism for 40 days and 40 nights, he was in the wilderness tempted of the devil than when later in the garden he suffered and was tempted. Now, uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones say, continues to say, he suffered being tempted. Where did he suffer? We read in 1 Peter 4, 1, for so much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh. How could he suffer in the flesh when in that flesh there was nothing or uh, when his flesh was beyond that which could suffer? Arm yourself likewise with the same. What flesh? Arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the last of men, but to the will of God. He was tempted in the flesh, he suffered in the flesh, but he had a mind which never consented to sin. Let therefore this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Arm yourself with the same mind the mind of God, and let that mind have control over the body, and you will experience in your own self the mystery, the power that Christ, Jesus Christ has over all flesh, the power that God himself has to demonstrate his own perfect righteousness under the very worst possible condition that the devil could devise, and thus he shows his power over the devil. And then we are told, let this mind that was in Christ be in you. There is no place in the scripture that says, let this flesh that Christ had be also your flesh. Never does the Bible say that. And then it says, walk ye in the spirit and you will not satisfy the sinful lust of the flesh, which means that uh, there are pools of sin from within. 
But when the will of man is subjected to Christ, when we have the power, the mind of Christ indwelling in us, the Holy Spirit, then we are able to control the desires of the body. The pulse can be there, but then the mind which has been given to Christ can be able to conquer that. We are told that, uh, 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 yeah, walking in spirit and will not uh, satisfy the uh, uh, sinful lust of uh, the flesh. And uh, then look at again what uh, Paul says that um, in the book of Galatians, I'll go to the book of Galatians. Uh, in the same book, Galatians chapter 5, and I start from verse 16, this I say then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that you would. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest and he goes on to say what are the works of the, the flesh. And so man who have received the spirit of Christ has not received the flesh of Adam preferred. Christ in his fallen nature, he did not have the flesh of Adam preferred else he will not have the temptation from within. And how could he be for us an example if he did not have the pull of sin from within? He cannot succor them that are tempted from within because he never ex passed through the same experience so as to be able to redeem man who goes through the same. Uh, in uh, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, page 40, paragraph 20, uh, this is what uh, we read also. It is thoroughly understood that in his birth, Christ did partake of the nature of Mary. But the carnal mind is not willing to allow that God in his perfection of holiness could endure to come to men where they are in their sinfulness. Therefore, endeavor has been made to escape the consequences of this glorious truth, which is the emptying of self by inventing a theory that the nature of the Virgin Mary was different from the nature of the rest of mankind, that her flesh was not exactly such a flesh as is that of all mankind. This invention sets up that by some special means, Mary was made different from the rest of human beings, especially in order that Christ might be comingly born of her and inherit uh, that uh, different uh, flesh. And then um, again, we read that um, the invention has culminated in what is known as the Roman Catholic dogma of immaculate conception. Many Protestants, if not the vast majority of them, as well as other non-Catholics think that the immaculate conception refers to the conception of Jesus by the Virgin Mary, but this is altogether a mistake. It refers not all to the conception of Christ by Mary, but to the conception of Mary herself by her mother. Now, we are trying to look into the Holy Flesh Doctrine and the Immaculate Conception that Jesus was freed from this flesh. And even though the Holy Flesh movement did not teach that Mary was exempted from this flesh, they taught that Christ was exempted from this flesh. But then uh, the Holy Flesh movement, you have to remember they taught that somebody had to, to pass through the Gethsemane experience and have the translation faith, and then he will have a flesh that cannot die. What is the immaculate conception doctrine? This is what I want us to see how actually it is the same as the holy flesh doctrine. And uh, uh, I'll continue in uh, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald by uh, uh, Alon Alonzo Trevor Jones. The official and infallible doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was solemnly defined as an article of faith by Pope Pius the Eighth, speaking ex cathedra on the 8th of December 1854. 
It is as follows. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the blessed apostle Peter and Paul, and by our own authority, we declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary in the first instant of her conception by a special grace and privilege of Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, has been revealed by God, and therefore is to be firmly and steadfastly believed by all faithful. Now, the gist of the matter, the gist of the matter, I'll go to uh, this doctrine. The gist of the matter, what is it? As far as the sublime mystery of the incarnation can be reflected in the natural order, the Blessed Virgin under the overshadowing of the Holy Ghost by communicating to the second person of the adorable Trinity as mothers do, a true human nature of the same substance with her own is thereby really and truly his mother, faith of our fathers page, uh, pages 198 and 199. Then now put these two things together. First, we have the nature of Mary defined as being not only very different from the rest of mankind, but more sublime and glorious than all natures, thus putting her infinitely beyond any real likeness or relationship to mankind as we really are. And then, uh, this doctrine uh, continues uh, to say the Catholic doctrine of the human nature of Christ is simply that the nature is not human nature at all, but divine. It is that in his human nature, Christ was so far separated from mankind as to be utterly unlike a nature which he could have no sort of fellow feeling with mankind. But such is not the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus is that as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And so um, this experience, this is what I'm looking at. Uh, the experience that uh, Mary was able to go through. The experience that... Uh, Mary was able to go through. Uh, allow me to go to Adventist Review once again and Sabbath Herald. That uh, the, the joy of the truth about the nature of Christ uh, is that uh, he, he is placed where we are placed in that uh, we can partake of his example. We can partake of his example and be able to overcome. And uh, just a moment for this. Uh, I'll be giving you something to think about. Mm. Yes, this is uh, from uh, AMS. This should be American Sentinel. Uh, American Sentinel. And uh, let us see what uh, it teaches about uh, immaculate conception. And so, here it is that uh, what uh, we are talking about, about immaculate conception. We are looking at uh, the doctrine of the holy flesh and uh, how actually it is, it hangs together with uh, 
the doctrine of uh, immaculate conception, that is the doctrine of the holy flesh and uh, how it is the same doctrine of uh, immaculate conception repackaged, the holy flesh doctrine. Now, this is what Alonzo Trevor Jones says, sorry for that. In uh, Christ and his righteousness, page 27, before we come to AMS, if he was made in all things like unto his brethren, then he must have suffered all the infirmities and been subject to all the temptations of his brethren. Two more texts that put his, this matter very forcibly will be sufficient evident in this point. We first quote 2 Corinthians 5.21. Uh, For he, God, hath made him Christ to be seen for us who knew no sin that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. This is much stronger than the statement he was made unto the likeness of sinful flesh. He was made to be seen. Here is the same mystery as that the Son of God should die. The spotless Lamb of God who knew no sin was made to be seen. Sinless yet not only counted as a sinner but actually taking upon himself the sinful nature. Taking upon himself uh, a sinful nature. That is what um, uh, Alonzo Trevor, uh, uh, that is what Wagona tells us in uh, Christ and uh, his righteousness. Uh, his being made all things like unto his brethren is the same as being made in the likeness of sinful flesh, made in the likeness of man. One of the most encouraging things in the Bible is the knowledge that Christ took on him, the nature of man, to know that his ancestors, according to the flesh, were sinners. When we read the record of the lives of the ancestors of Christ and see that they had all the weaknesses and passions that we have, we find that no man has any right to excuse his sinful acts on the ground of heredity. If Christ had not been made in all things like unto his brethren, then his sinless life would be no encouragement to us. We might look at it with admiration, but it will be the admiration that will cause hopeless despair. And so this is how Wagona is reasoning. We have seen how Alonzo Trevor Jones reason, and now we can see what, how Wagona is reasoning that if Christ took the nature of Adam preferred, then we have a most discouraging message before us. There is nothing encouraging in Christ taking a nature which is different from us. And then, and now as another parallel to Galatians 4, 4 and further source of encouragement to us, I'll quote uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he says, now when he... Now, when was Jesus made sin for us? It must have been when he was made flesh and began to suffer the temptations and infirmities that are incident to sinful flesh. He passed through every phase of human experience, being in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 53 verse 4, and this scripture is said by Matthew to have been fulfilled long before the crucifixion. So I say that his being born under the law was a necessary consequence of him being born in the likeness of sinful flesh, of taking upon himself the nature of Abraham. He was made like man in order that he might undergo the suffering of death from the earliest childhood the cross was ever before him. And so we, we, we can go on and on and look at um, uh, different witnesses and what our pioneers stood on this uh, matter, on this matter of uh, the, 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 the nature of Jesus Christ. And so we can all have hope that um, uh, we can be able to overcome sin because Christ came uh, in this nature and then he was able to overcome sin. Lastly, uh, lastly, let me just look at something.
uh, we read this, we read this. Uh, in uh, along the Trevor Jones in American Sentinel. He says, the opponents of the doctrine, besides declaring it to be unscriptural, asserted that it was absurd and said, on the same principle, you will be obliged to hold that the conception of our ancestors is an ascending line was also a holy one, since otherwise she could not have descended from them worthily. The logic of this objection is apparent, and unless met, it will necessitate the immaculate conception of Mary's whole pedigree, which will include David, who speaking for the rest, as well as for himself, says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, Roman Catholic tradition, which according to the teaching of the church is declared to be more clear and safe than the Bible says that Joachim and Anne were the parents of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it is by them we are told that the great feat of lifting the ancestry of Mary from sinful flesh to sinless flesh was accomplished. Of the traditional parents of Mary, it is stated that they showed themselves always so perfect in their whole conduct that one need not marvel that from such a perfection should come forth the one whose luster is as the mirror of goodness in ages past to and ages past and to come. But Saint Anne and Saint Joachim. This is what we are told. How then was this perfection attained? This is where I'm stopping. I'll, 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 I'll refer you back to 2SM, that um, these people that preach the Holy Flesh doctrine, they say that one passed through the Gethsemane experience, and then he got a Holy Flesh and translation faith and a body which could not die. And what is the doctrine of immaculate conception? Now I want you to hear it as we end. Let the Cardinal endorsed work as the same question and under it. By what gradation of virtues and perfection did he, St. Anne, raise herself to make this thing possible? Let us remember what Mary was from the first instant of her creation. And we shall be, we shall then be able to form an idea of what have being her mother. Must not the stem be worthy of the flower and the vase worthy of the perfume it contains? On leaving the hands of God, still under the actions of his creating breath, the soul of Mary was joined to a most pure body, forever virginal, immaculate like itself. However, Holy Joachim and Anne were at the time of their marriage they were not yet sufficiently so to give such a daughter as Mary to the world. So by multiplying their fasts, their alms, through so many long years in order to obtain this grace from God's goodness, they made rapid progress in perfection and in the love of God, and at length arrived at that degree of purity and holiness desired by the Holy Ghost. Thus, mortification and sacrifice had done their work in St. Anne and St. Joachim, purifying, refining, and not leaving in them even the shadow of defilement. God could take of that pre-sanctified earth to create his well-beloved daughter, who after God sees none superior or equal to herself, either in holiness, in glory, or in power, purer than the angels, holier than the archangels. Now, but while all these theological dispute, disputes and furious contentions and purple bulls of anathema and infallible decisions in the Roman Catholic Church concerning the Immaculate Conception of Mary and Immaculate Purity of St. Anne and St. Joachim, it was to sanctify the royal blood when our Savior was to be born. Mary was declared sinless because the blood transmitted to Mary was to form the divine flesh. 
Saint Anne and Saint Joachim are represented as making themselves immaculate because the blood of Joachim and Anne passed through the most pure heart of Mary was to become the blood of Jesus. And so after the storm of contention is over and Franciscans and Jesuits have won and the thunder of Vatican finished the creation of uh, a savior, what do we behold? We see a savior whose blood was purified by mortification and sacrifice of his grandparents and whose divine flesh was formed by the blood made purer than the angels, holier than the archangels through his grandmother and grandfathers multiplying their fast and their alms and good works. And so the story goes on and on, but then it, it frustrates everything that has to do with Christ being our perfect example. The last slides, we read, she Anne is the mother of her who is purer than angels, holier than archangels, higher than the thrones, more powerful than the dominations, more enlightened than the cherubim, more inflamed with divine love than the seraphims. She is the mother of her who is called and who is the eldest daughter of the father, the true mother of the son, the spouse of the Holy Ghost. She is the mother of her who is full of grace, of her who is bestowed and still bestows random on the captive, strengthened to the weak, sight to the blind, consolation to the afflicted, hope to the desponding, an overflow of joy to the angels, human flesh to the divine word, a worshiper worthy of his greatness to the eternal father, a temple worthy of his holiness to the Holy Ghost. Anne is the mother of her who is the ladder of heaven, the anchor of the shipwrecked, the, the star of the mariner, the bridge where by God crossed the abyss which separated us from him. And then Eti Jones at last says, away with your merry ladder and immaculate bridge. Jesus is the ladder and it is lowest, lower most round reaches as low as the lowest sin. In order that he might reach sinful men, verily he took on him the nature of, he, verily he took on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. For so much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took of the same. What part of the man's sinful flesh? Yeah, verily. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. For we have no for we have no and a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace without the papal ladder that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What is the bottom line of all these things? That um, there is no virtue in saying that uh, Christ came in the condition of Adam preferred, that he was so exempted from those he's going to save so that he may save them. It could not leave us an example. And the Holy Flesh doctrine that uh, we have to pass through the, the same experience and have the translation faith is not different from the Immaculate Conception where actually we are seeing that uh, after people passed through some certain uh, things in their life, they reached to a perfection in their flesh that they could give to Mary a flesh that could give birth to what they call God. And so Mary is called Mother God. And so we can think about these things and the implication they have in us. And sometimes we have to really examine what are, we kind, what are we trying to pass along the doctrines that we are passing? And so what is the essence of all saying what R.S. Donnell taught and how it hangs uh, 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 upon, uh, how it uh, really is like the Immaculate Conception Doctrine? Uh, Alonzo Trevor Jones said, all of us must come to a point we are sure we are out of the Roman Catholic Church. Because 
we as Seventh day Adventists cannot be found espousing sentiments that actually, when followed to their logical conclusion, brings about the issue of immaculate conception. And so may the Lord be with us, may he guide us, and may we think of what is true. And in the end, may this truth sanctify us. And at the end of the day, be not as the men who are cunningly followed after uh, are cunningly devised fables, but are men following the truth. Error does not sanctify, but truth sanctified. And I pray that uh, we will continue in the truth as uh, we continue to expound on the nature of Christ and the nature of man. And then we shall have that meeting point. What is God calling us to do? Is he calling us to have a sinless flesh or is he calling us to have a sinless mind? Because our theology will make either people give up in their Christian journey or give them strength in their Christian journey. May the Lord bless us and shall we end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for you will want to sanctify us and you will say that uh, the 144, they did not defile themselves with women. They did not have these strange doctrines. And so we want also to be purified our minds. We want to have a communion with thee. The Lord, even as you have said that out of our mouths, you have ordained thy praises and you shall speak through human instrumentalities. We may not find ourselves being used of the devil and teaching mysticism that uh, will confuse the mind of men. And so thank you for this privilege of sharing in thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord be with you and may he continue guiding you in all truth. Blessed Sabbath to those who are still in the Sabbath and uh, blessed evening to those who have come to the end of the Sabbath. Bye for now.